Good morning and welcome to the River Christian Fellowship. We have a heavy hitter lineup of guest speakers that you won't want to miss starting today with Frank Sontag. We'll have a different special guest speaking every week all the way through May 9th. Check our Facebook page for more information. But now, let's learn a little bit about Frank. Now, Frank has an amazing story. In fact, he has a new book that has come out called Light the Way Home. And in fact, Lee Strobel wrote the foreword for this book. And Frank was impacted by one of Lee's books, The Case for Christ, as so many were. But Frank's story is really quite unusual. Uh, For starters, he came to faith in his 50s. You know, most people come to Christ when they're younger. Uh, Many before the age of 18, but Frank came to faith in his 50s. And he went through a lot of twists and turns before he came to Christ. He actually was a leader in the New Age movement. He was a person who would give seminars and teachings on New Age mysticism. But what happened, the way he got there was, as a younger man, he was out riding a motorcycle one day and he was hit by a car going over 100 miles per hour. Amazingly, he survived this uh, without a scratch, relatively speaking. And so this sent him on a quest uh, for the meaning of life, which unfortunately led him to this new age guru that sort of uh, indoctrinated Frank in the ways of that belief system. And so there he was, a New Age leader, and he also hosted a popular radio program on uh, the rock station KLOS. He interviewed a lot of the royalty of rock and roll over the years and so forth. But then God got hold of him, and he came to faith. God's Word is living and active and opening a Bible. It's amazing how many times I can read a particular passage and chapter and reread it. It it speaks to me in a whole different way. And I would humbly like to attribute that to some growth spiritually that I've experienced in my life. But in the minute I have, I want to tell you who this Jesus man, who this Jesus God is, the answer to all your questions struggles and all your dilemmas and all of your hopes and prayers. It's only found in Christ. In my new age days, I would hear that and go, that's so intolerant. There's got to be another way. If you found a cure for an ailment, one cure that would literally cure you, why would you be interested in anything else? And I don't want to somehow simplify the Word of God and the sacrifices our Savior made into a cure, but He's the answer to everything. He's a king, He's a warrior, He's a Savior, He's the great I Am. We hope you have enjoyed this brief introduction to our special guest, Frank Sontag. Go ahead, grab your Bible, get comfortable, and get ready to join us for service.
want you to raise your hands and sing this. Holy Spirit. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. If you'd all like to stand. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation is now revealed. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave, the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, oh, you are raised to life again, and you
beautiful name, other name under heaven whereby we may be saved. As we turn to your word this morning, Lord, we ask that your spirit would continue to enlighten us, Lord. Fill us with knowledge and wisdom for what you have out of your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. everybody. Glad you've uh, come and showed up today and uh, see what great things God will do. Um, just want to say especially to all of those that were baptized last Sunday night, 30, about 30 people were baptized. I, I just want to say may the Lord just continue to en enrich your life in every way because again, it's one of the first things we do as an act of obedience to God. Now I know that a lot of people accept Christ and they're doing things, but Really, when it comes down to baptism, that's what it really is, a demonstration of our obedience towards Christ. And so it's a great thing. Um, next Sunday morning, we're going to have with us Ryan Reese. And uh, many of you remember Ryan. He's um, Ralph Reese's son, has uh, the Whosoever's ministry outreach to high school, college people. So especially if you know anybody that's in the high school, college world, bring him here next Sunday. I I know they're really going to be blessed by that as Ryan uh, has these different outreaches to skateboard parks and all the crazy stuff that he does. Uh, it's really a great, a great ministry. And so that's next Sunday morning. I think you'll enjoy that. This morning, I have a special guest, Frank Sontag from KKLA, actually from Los Angeles, hosts a live call-in talk show. In fact, I don't think you can be on our talk show because you're under contract with their talk show. Anyway, uh, but uh, Frank uh, uh, leads a, a couple of pretty large ministries, especially for men, thousands of people, and, and uh, so uh, we're just really great and blessed to have uh, Frank with us this morning. So Frank, come on up, came from uh, Southern California, and uh, Lord bless you. <laughs> bless you, Frank. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Now, I will um, share with you and just get you a sense as we begin here. Um, I've not always been a follower of our king. Amen. In fact, before I say anything, let me just open in prayer. Father God, we are in awe of you and who you are. And Lord, I just pray that w whatever comes out of my mouth is from you and not me. Please anoint this fool saved by your grace and by the cross of our King, that whatever it is that I'm to impart may be glorifying to you and to speak to the hearts and souls of our brothers and sisters in this room. I pray this in the name above all names, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So I, th I think it would be important, and I feel like I'm in, a, I'm in a cage up here. I want to come down a little bit, but I think I should stay right here. Um, you know, the Lord had me up a good chunk of the night. What am I going to share tomorrow? I'm not one to write things down. I don't, oh boy, here we go. Don't walk out. Stay here. I, by the end, here's my hope and prayer. By the end of this morning, that you would know a little bit more about me and a lot more about him. Because when I think of the journey he's had me on, it's only him. And so I want to share a little bit about kind of how I got here, if that would be okay with you. Let me just open in God's word. Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. And for me, that doesn't simply mean carrying a heavy burden, but that we as followers must be completely willing to die to ourselves and live for God, even at the cost of our own lives. This is God's word. 
So I was kind of born and raised in a little place called Cleveland, Ohio. Many times in my later years, I had a relationship with God as I knew God, and I would ask, why did you, why did you pick Cleveland of all places? It's a great place to be from. We were there till I was 10, and my dad got a job in the movie industry in Hollywood, and so he announces one day, we're going to move to Hollywood. Now, I had a lot of friends. When you're young, you want to kind of stay in the environment you're raised in. So we got on a plane, came to L.A. for the first time, and never went back to Cleveland. And I don't know what was going on in the 60s. I think a lot of us had some crazy ideas, but needless to say, culture has changed a little bit because literally the moment I landed as a 11-year-old young boy, I met up with my godfather's son who was 13. We got on a bus and we went to the beach, just him and I. Uh, Johnny Carson, you may remember, kind of made Cleveland famous with the old Cuyahoga River burning on fire. It really was. And I never saw a beach. I never saw actual waves. So my godfather's son, Jimmy, and I are on a bus to Santa Monica. No adult supervision. I still wonder, what were my parents thinking? Maybe they were just glad to kind of get us out. Anyway, we went to the beach and... The first thing I saw when we got off the bus, and I'll keep it G-rated, was a little blonde girl. Now, in Cleveland, I don't know what the deal was, but all the girls were brunettes. I never really saw a blonde girl. And I thought, and the sun was out, and the waves were moving, and I thought, wow, this is like a whole nother world. So, that was kind of when I began my young adulthood and was raised Catholic. I'm Italian, um, as Shannon was sharing. Dragged to church on Sunday in a Catholic church. And I know people, I'm not in, into a, a, a time of where I want to get into doctrines and who's saved, who's not. Um, but I really knew that I kind of wanted to get out of the environment. I knew God. I thought I knew God. But here was my first moment where I'm like, I'm not so sure I want to follow him. Now, I, I grew up loving horses, uh, thoroughbreds in particular, race horses. And I knew from a very early age, from age three, four, I was just obsessed with horse racing. Back when we had newspapers, I would cut out little articles from the horses that ran at Thistledown. That was the Cleveland track the derby, everything else, and I would have these scrapbooks filled of horses and races, and I knew, I knew God had a plan for my life, and I knew I was going to be um, a racehorse jockey. <laughs> Take a good look. Unless we race Clydesdales, I knew at one point in my life that wasn't going to happen. So we moved to L.A., and I went to high school, and I started um, growing. In two years from my sophomore to my senior year, I went from 5'1", and rather heavy, to 6'2", and I started playing basketball. And I was like, I had my life all planned out. God, really? And I would go to some of the local racetracks, and... It got to one point where some of my friends, I'm like, well, I could be a hot walker. I wanted to stay in the track, but obviously God had other plans. And I tell you that story because it's important. So many times I think, at least for me, we, we want to make these bargains with God. Or we say, I'm not so sure I want to follow you anymore because your plan is not my plan. And so early on, I got a taste of that. And when I graduated high school, at the age of 16, I skipped the fourth grade. And that's a whole story for another time. But at the age of 16, I said, I'm done. I'm out. I want to go out into the world, see what the world has for me. 
And so announced to my family, I'm not going back to church, and I'm going to kind of do my own thing. So for a period of about 12 years, I went out into the world, did a bunch of stuff, don't even need to get into. But at the age of 28, I did what a lot of young men who were just kind of seeking identity did, and I bought a motorcycle, which I look back now, I think that was my, my angst to try to, I called it my electric horse, but bought a motorcycle in the spring of 1984, um, left the house. My father had divorced my mom. I'm a product of a divorce home. And I had a lot of anger toward the world and my family. And I was just living for me out in the world. So I got this motorcycle, fell in love. It was my sole means of transportation. One summer afternoon, I decided I'm going to go to the racetrack to see one horse run, which as the story goes, the horse's name literally was Light the Way Home, which is the name of biograph my biography, my book. And uh, I invited the woman that I had been dating, and we are all brothers and sisters in Christ in this room, so I just want to just give you a sense. Um, we all have things in our past lives before we had new life in Christ that we look back on and I believe the evil one wants to keep us there in so many ways. I work with guys that struggle with um, alcoholism and drug addiction and, and domestic violence and a whole lot of other things in my men's ministry. And stereotypically, what they mostly fight is their past and the lies of the past. And Satan, that's his lair. He wants to keep us in the past. And then Jesus says, no, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's in freedom in Christ. He wants us to walk with him and follow him. So all that to say this, I was dating a woman who was married, and I knew it, and to kind of exemplify the genius of a young man, in my mind at 28, angry at the world, dating a woman, I would pick a woman that was married to a Los Angeles police officer. <laughs> but I didn't care. I had all this justification in my mind, and her reasoning is between her and God as she knew God. So we go to Hollywood Park, watch a horse run, light the way home. We're riding back after the race. By the way, he ran dead last. Went all the way out there to watch this one big white horse. And as we're riding back to my apartment, it started to rain a little bit. In 1984, in California, there were no mandatory motorcycle helmet laws. Now, this will probably be the only time this morning I'm going to ask you to have a little bit of imagination or a lot of imagination. In 1984, I had a full head of long hair. <laughs> so why would I wear a helmet, right? We're riding back to my apartment. At 5 of 6 on a Sunday late afternoon, I looked in my mirror to make a lane change, and I saw a car just... And my last thought on impact was, this is it. By the way, I'm a crier. I'll warn you right now. They're not sad tears. They're tears of joy that I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. In the aftermath, CHP said impact was 110. And I saw it. I held onto the bike as long as I could. The last moment I let go. And I went flying, and the woman I was seeing went up and impact. Um, praise God, she survived. She had to have brain surgery. It was just a, a hard time. Um, in fact, I had to call her husband because she had to have permission to have surgery from a family member. And I remember thinking, Frank, what are you doing with your life at 28? You're, you're seeing a married woman. She's got children. Now I have to call her husband and what am I doing angry at my father all this stuff but I will tell you when I called him to give permission and he came to the emergency room he was the most gentlest kind of spirit of a grown man I had ever met I didn't have a lot of male role models and I'm convinced he was a follower of Christ for a lot of things I found out after the fact she survived I made the commitment I, I'm not going to do this anymore 
I moved to the west side of Lake Tahoe in the middle of winter, trying to get my head together and my life together. You would think I ran to the Lord after that, because I knew there's no way I should have survived this. Absolutely no way. Almost impossible. I had no broken bones. I was torn up pretty good with road rash, and they gave me little Brillo pads with iodine for two weeks to scrape the asphalt out of my body. But I survived, and I wanted to know on some level, what happened? Why did I survive this? I spent three months, cold winter in Tahoe, just kind of seeking God as I still did not know God, who I thought God was. Moved back to Southern California and fell into the radio industry. Now, in college, I played a little basketball. We had to take uh, speech classes. I, I avoided those like the plague. Uh, I dropped out a couple of times, terrified to take a speech class. God does have a sense of humor. I've been in radio 35 years now, and I'll tell you a little bit of that story. So I started doing a radio program in Southern California, and the man, my first gig in radio was I was a call screener for two talk shows. And the one big, famous talk show host on Sunday night, I didn't know anything about the New Age, but was one of the biggest New Age teachers in Southern California. If you don't know what New Age was then, it still promised. But it's kind of changed and morphed into our culture. New Age, loosely put, is the worship of self. That we are sparks of the divinity. There's a lot of spiritual overtones. Jesus is acknowledged, but not as the Son of God. He's kind of one of the disciples. One of the, they call him the Lord of love. And when I tried to get my life back together and fell into the new age on some level it satiated a hunger for the meaning of life why did i survive what am i doing with my life but it was still missing the only answer in life and that's our true savior so for 21 years i did a radio program in la i took over from the big talk show host and began leading seminars and workshops all over Southern California, teaching people how special they were. We would acknowledge God, but knew nothing about spiritual warfare. I really, I, I had planned on giving you a, a sermon on spiritual warfare, and the Lord said last, last night, no, no, no. You tell my flock who I am. And I'm here to tell you who he is. You know but to tell you anew through my life and how he's begun a transformation in my life. So I did this New Age show. I got all popular. The LA Times ran a front page article on me. They called me a New Age guru. I was eating that all up and thinking, man, I'm really something. In some ways, it, it gave me meaning in life. I would talk a lot about loving people, People would call my program that were the Christians. And to be very transparent, I could not hang up on them fast enough. They would start quoting scripture to me. I would mock Christ on the air. I was a heathen. Still, after God sparing my life at the age of 28, where I should have just been one with the freeway, no reason I should have survived that, I still had so much sin in me and so much strong will and pride, I still denied him in front of thousands of people. You know, in the New Age, they talk about we're good and to be loving, and the answer is just us getting together and coexisting and a lot of other messages that have remnants of God's truth, but not the absolute truth. Relativism is very popular in New Age. I mean, again, it's our culture. You look at today and the, 
the direction of the world. There's, there's no moorings. There's no uh, establishment of, of an absolute creator of everything. We've almost come to a place where we're almost in full rebellion against him. And I, and I mean this with all respect. I, nothing that, that I believe the Lord wants me to share with you, I share out of nothing but respect. And, and yet, one of my biggest issues now is that, I'll say it in a nice way, the church needs to start standing for the Lord. Needs to start talking about his fire and his redemptive powers. I've met a lot of pastors in my eight years in L.A. on the radio. We'll talk about that season in a moment. And I, and I don't fault any pastor. To do this, what Pastor Mike has done for decades, I, can't, I cannot even begin to comprehend the amount of spiritual warfare and everything that happens. I didn't believe in spiritual warfare. I didn't believe in the devil. New Age thinks that evil is the absence of good, and it's just if we all love each other, that's it. Boy, what a lie that one is. There is a father of lies that would do everything he can to separate us from the only answer in this short life and the life that is to come. And I say this not of, out of a belief, I say this out of a knowing, and I'll tell you how I know this. I'll, I'll share what happened to me, and then I'm going to impart a few things I think that are important that you, that you need to hear. So my best friend, we did a lot of things together. He was one of my followers in my new age haunt. In 2006, he calls me one day and he says, I've got great news. He said, I've become a Christian. Now, what came out of my mouth versus what was the truth inside me were two different things. What came out of my mouth was, well, if that makes you happy, that's wonderful. But inside, my thoughts were, no, don't become one of them. I'm losing my best friend. He's going to become a Jesus freak and start throwing the Bible at me. And, and it's not that I'm not okay with that, but I'm a new age teacher. It's much more about all paths lead to God. And just loving people where they are. But I will tell you, in the three years before a moment that I want to share with you, I watched his life completely change. And he didn't push anything on me. He didn't, like, start throwing scripture and saying. He just slowly walked with our king, Jesus Christ, and would say things to me. Frank, there's so much more to your life than just what you're doing. That there is someone who is the answer to everything. And I'm like, it's good for you. Don't tell me too much. But I watched his life completely change. His older brother uh, was and is still an evangelical pastor. And I developed a friendship with both of them. For three years, we did a lot of things together. I knew they loved me and accepted me but they didn't approve of some of the things I was doing. And I think that's really important for those of us that love the Lord. You may have a family member. You may have a friend who is lost and wayward, maybe prodigal. And it's much more difficult to say than to do, but to love someone where they're at and accept them, I think is biblical. Jesus said the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. But he did say what the first one was, above all, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything you have. So I knew they had my back, and they invite me one day to play a round of golf. Does anyone in this room play golf? Okay, it is an evil, evil game. You're supposed to hit this little white ball with a stick, and all the other things, and I've actually played a lot. So it was kind of a routine. We would go out and play golf once or twice a month. 
But this particular day I didn't know, after much prayer, these two brothers, these two men of God, decided to do what I call a Christian intervention. And so they invite me to play a round of golf. It was the third or the fourth hole, and I, I probably have changed the story over the years. Pastor Dale says, that's not exactly the way it went down. But I remember I had a five iron in my hand, and I'm about ready to hit an approach shot, and I'm backswing. He goes, what's your problem with Jesus Christ? And I wanted to wrap that five iron around his neck. I'm like... Really? Quote, we're in God's house right now. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day. He's here. So let's play golf. I'm good with Jesus. We don't need to do this. And how pastors have this ability, they'll just kind of look at you and smile like they see through you. How many of you have walked into either Pastor Mike's church or another church where the pastor's preaching and you're like, how, how does he know? Like, it's coming right at you, right? That's because God's word is so true. So Pastor Dale just kind of looked at me. He didn't respond. We go to lunch, and the fun ensued. For two and a half hours, they hammered me with the gospel. It was like they got me to say everything. You know, are you a sinner? Have you ever stolen, cheated? You're going down the checklist. Now, I didn't feel like they were ganging up on me because I knew they loved me. So out of respect, I sat. They did treat me. I didn't have to pay for lunch, so I'm thinking free food. I'll sit. After two and a half hours, and I heard and I knew the truth that I was not right with God, that I was kind of doing my thing, even though I was saying that I was a spiritual teacher. One of the greatest, in terms of numbers growing, groups in the United States are those that say they're spiritual but not religious. And they're doing their own thing. They may even say they're Christian. I have met a lot of self-identified Christians in my ministry, and I'm like, dude, you don't know the Lord. I'm very confrontative in my men's ministry, and I'll share a little bit about it at the end of what we do. So at the end of two and a half hours, they kind of did the, well, and I know they wanted me to say, I give up, I'm in, sign me up. And what came out of my mouth was, pride is such a sin. If it's good for you, it makes you happy. Have a good day. But me, I'm a spiritual teacher. I'm good. I had just been blessed with my newborn son. My wife and I had been married a handful of years. She also was raised Catholic, walked away, new age. We were soulmates. Y'all hear about soulmates, how there's only one person out there for you. And some of us have spent time with our soulmates and Somehow they change and they're not our soulmates anymore and then we go find the other right one. So my wife and I began our marriage on shaky ground. She looked to me as this, you talk about an idol, she would acknowledge it if she was here. Marriage, new son, job was good, popular. Made money, bought a house at the height of the market. Boy, by the outside, from society standards, I had it all. Except hair. Except God took that away from me right after the crash. <laughs> so Pastor Dale says, okay. And I was a meditation teacher. He said, Frank, would you do me a favor before you drive home? And I'm thinking, oh, here it comes. He's going to have me open a Bible and do something crazy like those Christians. He said, would you sit in your car and meditate? And he air quoted me. So he was making the point. Would you meditate if you're right with God? 
And I'm thinking, come on, man. I've been in the trenches for 21 years as a new age teacher. I talk about God all the time. People, I talk about love, and I throw Jesus in there. I'm good with God. Jesus and me are like this. And he gave me that look again. And he said, you know, 25 years ago, you should not have survived that motorcycle crash. And here we are. And if you don't make it home today, if something like that happens today, God forbid, you have a beautiful wife, a brand new baby boy, everything, are you right with God if you don't make it home? And I just, poof, I felt like I was pierced. But I didn't lead on. And he said, would you sit in your car and meditate on if you're right with God? <clears throat> So I acquiesced. I was kind of angry and defensive, but I, again, I knew they loved me. So I sat in the car, and I started to become very hot, like I had a fever. And my first thought was, in December in SoCal, sometimes you've got your nice warm days. It was hot. I didn't wear a baseball cap. I'm like, did I get too much sun? I started going through the checklist in my mind. And I'm like... No, I'm okay. And then I heard a voice. And the voice said, are you ready to submit to me? Now, submission is a very interesting word. In my years now following Jesus, I hear some people say, Jesus loves everybody, and he hung out with sinners, and all this terminology like, you know, he's our guy. He's cool like us. But submission indicates authority. It's not like the voice said, are you ready to hang out with me? Are you ready to call me your old man? Or all these expressions. He said, are you ready to submit to me? And I'm just going to be very, very blunt I felt no coercion, no fear. I was just, yes. And then he said, pick up your cross and follow me. I had never heard that before. In Catholicism, we did catechism. We never really opened one of these. And some of you are thinking, yeah, well, pick up your cross. That's in Mark, it's in Luke. I had no clue. In fact, in my time now as a, as a pastor and a leader of men's ministry, I oftentimes question people, do you really understand what picking up your cross means? And depending on who you ask that question to, you'll get a whole array of answers. And I've done a lot of praying and fasting and soul searching. From what I've arrived at, picking up your cross means dying to yourself. And I will tell you, Probably not here, but out there, there are a lot of self-identified Christians that are about 90% in for God. And they hold a little bit back. We've got problems, struggles. In my men's ministry, the number one struggle is addiction, whether it's substance, alcohol, pornography, all that. And I tell them, part of the problem is you're not all in for him. You're still holding a little bit for you. But when he spoke to me and said, are you ready to submit? I'm, I, I, in that moment, I'm like, I'm all in. So I sat a little while longer. The sensation went away. I sat there and I'm like, so I call my two buddies and I said, I, I, I don't know what just happened, but I think I want to go back to church. I'd been 37 years since I stepped foot in the church. You couldn't get me in church. But he's getting married. Also, I never would step into a church. I think I want to go back to church. And Pastor Dale said, I know a good church. I don't know if anybody here knows of Pastor Francis Chan. He became my first pastor. He's a man that doesn't compromise any of the gospel. So God put me in a Bible preaching, teaching church with a pastor that was on fire. So 
So I'm driving home thinking, I can't wait to share this with my wife. My wife is a beautiful, six-foot, Irish, fiery woman. And anybody in this room that is married, and if you're a man, by the way, I identify as a man, he, him, Whew, boy, you talk about we're really showing how we don't know the truth of God. But anyone in here that's a man that has a woman as God's plan in marriage, you know that God made women so uniquely different, equal but uniquely different. Sometimes they don't even have to say something where you know, oh boy. It's just this vibe or a tone in the voice. So I walk in, and I'm like, honey, I'm home. I was at the age of 54 when I gave my life to the Lord in this moment. And some of you might be thinking, 54? You look like you're 40. But see, we're good at deceiving ourselves still. <laughs> she says, I'm in the front room. And I'm like, "Woo!" The first words out of her mouth, don't tell me you gave your life to Christ. Thank you. Huh? Well, by the goodness of social media, they had put on Facebook that our good friend just gave his life to the Lord. Now, I had no idea what I was in for other than I said yes to the king of the universe. I have sat in Christian churches where a pastor preaches all this lovey-dovey. It's all good. Like Jesus is a life coach and it's 10 steps to happiness. Well, I learned early on, that's not the risen Savior. That is part of his plan to bestow upon us the purpose and plan for our lives and the blessings and the fact that we have literally, that we don't deserve we're saved by his grace, and he has a plan for our lives, both now in the short life and, and for what is to come forever. But I've been in some churches where they just kind of do this, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. He does. But what about the cross? Like early on for me, he told me, pick up your cross and follow me, and I still didn't know what that meant. So the same day that I literally sensed the risen Savior had a radical encounter with him, my wife said, I'm out. Son was a year and a half. And let's just say over 18 months, it was a rough ride. God took away everything. Friends, family, job, house, Stripped it all away. But I will tell you, five weeks after this moment I'm sharing with you, this came in the mail. Pastor Dale mailed me the Bible. I'd been in church for five weeks. This is what a good, God-fearing man I was. I knew red letters meant Jesus. That's all I knew. Can't sleep, crying like a baby. I want my son, I want my wife, what am I doing? Did that really happen? I open the Bible, and it just opens up to Luke. I'm like, what's this say? And it's red letters. First words of the Bible I read, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me. I'm like, I hit the ground and I said, I don't know what's happening. I started to doubt what I experienced, but I said, I'm all in. I am all in. I will not waver because I understood that he saved me from myself. So that began my walk in Christ. That was the starting point. God is a God of redemption. He's a God of reconciliation. It does not always work out as plan doesn't always manifest in life because sometimes we get in the way but i praise god my wife came back she gave her life to the lord a year and a half later our son now who's 13 
and I want to, you know, discipline's an important thing. <laughs> boy, you know, if you have a youngin, especially boys when they hit that age, oh boy. In fact, I'll tell you a short story. So this is what a, a good Christian leader I am as a man of God. And part of me is like, I can't believe I'm telling him the story. But you know what? One of the things we have to do as brothers and sisters, we got to start sharing all our stuff, not just the good stuff. I watch in my men's ministry so many guys just get taken out, isolated. And, and COVID has a part in this. And they get checked out, they're isolated, and they start doing dumb stuff. But we don't say, look, I need help. You know, if somebody is watching this or, look, if you're in trouble, just reach out. If you're a man and you don't have a couple guys in your life that know more about you than you, I'd like to suggest maybe it's time to start thinking about that. Because the flesh is so strong, we want to do it ourselves. So th this is what I shared with my son about a week ago. He was really getting on my nerves. I said, son... And he's growing now. I said, I'm thinking about selling you. <laughs> he just kind of looked at me. The next week, last week, I was doing a fundraiser on the air for a ministry that I support greatly. I called my wife, and I said, honey, this ministry is on. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart, we give every year. Would you give? And she said, absolutely, I'll call. So I'm on the air, I do a three-hour radio program, I get off the air, and I get a text on my phone from my wife, call me ASAP. I call her, and she's laughing. I'm like, what's going on? She said, well, I called in to give to the ministry. And Dante is the name of our son. Dante's on the couch, <laughs> and he's doing video games with his friends, and and he hears me say on the phone, how much for a child? <laughs> True story. Because the, the fundraiser was for saving children in Africa. She said literally 10 seconds later, she hears, ah! he's bawling like a little kid. She looked over. He says, Daddy said he's going to sell me. Don't sell me. I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry. I forgive me. Oh, he just starts blurting out all this stuff. So I thought, okay, now what can I do with this as a teaching moment as a father? So I get home that night, and I said, son, meet me in your bedroom. He's like, oh, boy. And I said, what happened today? Nothing. What happened today? And he starts crying again. I thought you were going to sell me. I, I just, and I said, son, when you're done crying, I'm going to tell you something. And I praise God because at that moment in June of 84, now my wife, my son, others have become followers. I said, son, you've already been bought. You already know. You've been saved by the only answer in this life. And you just start looking at me. Now at 13, he's entertaining a lot of different things, but... I am grieved by the state of families in our country. Now, I'm not here to beat anybody up. I beat guys up in my ministry, but they get to know me first before I really start bringing the hammer on. So I'm not here to make you feel bad, but we live at a time where fatherlessness is normalized, families under attack, guys have been taken out, and we need to get back in. We're going to get knocked down. You got to get back up. If you're in a foxhole in a war, you don't want your guy next to you to say how much he loves you. Like, we got that one down. You want to know he's got your back. And we as the body of Christ, I absolutely am convinced. I mean, look at what's going on in the world. We need to know we have each other's back, ultimately by the risen Savior. But we need each other. You are a blessed group to have a church like this and live 
in a place like Twin Falls. I've never been here. My dad and my stepmom, when they retired, they moved outside of Boise to a little town called Homedale. When they said they were moving, I'm like, Idaho? We do road trips regularly. My father went home to the Lord six years ago. But, I mean, this is, you are blessed. I live in L.A. Churches aren't open. There's a few pastors that understand if ever there's a time we need to open God's house, it's now or then. So there are a few that understand the battle that's at hand, and, and here you are. You're being gracious and, and patient with me on this Sunday to listen to my message, which is his message. But if I impart, in, impart anything with you, two things. Number one, I want to encourage you. Stay strong in the Lord. Satan is a liar. And he is desperate right now. And number two, love our king with everything you have. If you're not all in, recommit. We did a men's retreat last weekend in my ministry called Man Camp. Uh, it was in the snow. And I think men in Idaho are probably a little different from men in Southern California. I'm stereotyping. But it starts sprinkling a little snow, and it's a 30-mile drive up an interstate. And I'm getting texts, oh, I... I don't know if I'm going to make it. And a whole lot of stuff, and I'm like, trying to separate my flesh from the ministry. We had some guys tap out, but Sunday morning, when the temps was uh, 32 and the pool was not much warmer, we baptized 15 guys. And boy, you, you ain't seen a brother pop out of the water. When you're all in for the king, he gives you spiritual eyes, a heart, and a truth and a power that you'll never come close to in this life. That throws a lot of stuff out there. Fame, fortune, all that stuff. And you, you, you see people that have that, most of them crash and burn. And I'm not here to say we don't see people in the pulpit crashing and burning. Wow. Lord's like, don't leave before you say this. So in my ministry in L.A., I've, I've met a lot of high-profile Christian leaders. How many of you knew who Zach Ravi Zacharias was? A few of you. He had a huge ministry um, passed away a handful of months ago, and now they're discovering he had uh, a very immoral life. Ministry's broken, devastated. Thousands of people that got saved through his ministry are like. And the one truth is, undeniable truth, when people call me and say, I say, Robbie didn't save you, Jesus saved you. Through Robbie, we're all imperfect, we're all flawed, we're all sinful, not rationalizing or justifying anything, but my goodness, cry out to our king. He's there for you right now. He wants to use you. My, my friends, if God can use a fool like me, I've been on the radio in L.A. for eight years now. Um, every day I crack the microphone, I know I'm not equipped to do a show like that i'm gonna get on the radio a guy when i took it over i was two years saved god puts me in a position to share his truth with who knows how many people and literally i hear regularly a few times a week who are you oh just give up this thing you're a fraud. You're a phony. I know. Come on. We know what you do. It goes from I to we. Satan's got some minions with him for sure. Spiritual attack is real. I see so many guys not understanding God's word or the truth of what 
when you sin, what you're opening up your lives and your family to. But my heart is for the Lord. I've had lots of opportunities to tap out. It's not about how special I am. I'm a broken fool. I mess up every day. I told my son I wanted to sell him last week. Part of me was thinking about it. But I just want to encourage you. Cry out to the Lord. He's so good. And you're like, I do that. I want to encourage you to keep doing that. And if you're going through a trial, if this has been a really rough season for you, we've all watched the world change in a year. Sometimes it's hard to go, God, really? Why? One of the first pastors that I studied under, when we met him, his little six-year-old daughter had cancer. And he had a reputation, they had a reputation for being all in for Jesus. And I was new in the Lord. I'm like, I want to see that. I want to see people that are really all in for the Lord. Where whatever is going on in their lives, not that they put on phony smiles, not that we have this Christianese, but love the Lord. You are his beloved. You are his son. You are his daughter. You know it on some level. You know where he saved you from. Lord, when I think of what I used to do and where my heart is now, it's not me. It's undeniable. Holy Spirit, Jesus said I have to leave for the helper to come. His motley crew of 12 minus 1, they saw him do miracles and preach and do incredible things. They doubted. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to say, I'm really scared or I'm human or whatever it is. Lord, help me. Because his word says it's in our weakness that he is most strong. I wake up most mornings and go, Lord, I can't do this. I'm not equipped. And he says, pick up your cross and follow me. And when I follow him, I see things that happen that are undeniably him. Uh, I want to be sensitive to your time. I don't want to go too much longer here. Thank you for being so patient and hearing this. I was at the airport leaving from Burbank. I won't fly out of LAX if I can help it. And I had my ministry sweatshirt on. It says KMG with a big cross. Our ministry is Kingdom Men's Gathering. And uh, the woman behind the counter uh, said, good morning. She was very friendly. And then she got really quiet and she said, um, can I ask you a question? I'm like, sure. She said, um, what does that mean? I said, I have a small men's ministry in Southern California. We have a burden for biblical manhood and teaching men to be warriors and then breathing that to our younger sons and teaching them that God has made them to be leaders and to stand apart, count the cost. And she, she starts getting real emotional. She says, I have a 14-year-old son who has no dad. And she said, God, it's so good. She said, I think you, you're the answer to my prayer. And I'm like, ma'am, I gave her my card. That's my cell. If we can help your son, call me. So I asked myself when Mike and Shannon and everybody in your good church asked me to come speak. It's like, really? Me? I'm going to get up here and tell you how to be a good Christian and who Jesus is, me? God's got a plan. Maybe the whole thing with coming up here was just to meet that woman at the airport. I don't know. But I don't think that's entirely the truth. I think there may be a few of you in this church who needed to hear something I shared or something I'm going to share in closing. I don't know. 
But I want to continue to encourage you. Stay the course. Be vigilant. Read God's word. Ask God to heal you. So many of us are still so broken and wounded. God, I see it in men's ministry, and I'm literally saying, God, I see it in men's ministry. So many men that are so broken. And the biggest struggle is they won't admit they're broken. You can't get healed unless you say you're broken. And then we've got the Redeemer. We've got the great physician. We've got the healer. We've got the king that loves us, that pours the Holy Spirit in you every day. Because oftentimes I kind of lament, boy, I would have really liked to live 2,000 years ago and see what it was like to follow him. And yet I'm reminded, I am going to see him again very soon, and I will be able to follow him for eternity. But I've got the Holy Spirit in me, in you, in you, in you, in you. It's not, we're not alone. We've been given a precious gift. And all we have to do is ask for him to lead us or to console us. Whatever it is, he's in us. We have worship music that says the power that raised Jesus is in us. And I just have to be lovingly respectful to you and say I have talked to a lot of people that say they love the Lord and they don't let that in. They don't truly know the Holy Spirit is in us. That somehow we got to do this battle. The Bible talks about <laughs> this is not our battle. We are to wage battle, but not in our own might or in our own will, in His. And whether we pick up our cross and follow Him, when we put on the full armor of God, whatever it is, He is in control. And when you submit to Him again and again and say, I am all in. Forgive me of my sins. Repentance is a daily exercise for me many times. I, I repent so many times a day. Lord, and then, and then the evil one says, oh, here we go again. And I say, you better believe here we go again. The other thing is, by the blood of Christ, we have an authority. Authority. We have a power to rebuke the lies of the evil one. And I just wonder how many of us not only believe that, but know that. Because he is so desperate right now, he being the evil one, taking people out left and right, pastors, friends, family, guys tapping out, I can't do this anymore, leaving their kids. You rebuke that voice, not on my watch. By the power and the blood and the authority of Jesus, I shut your mouth and I bind you. And Lord, if they do not respond by spiritual law, Lord, you take care of that. I, I, I just, I have to tell you, and then I'll close, as, as a man who's followed the Lord for all of 11 years, and God has put me in a position by which I see many people in positions of leadership that have been walking with the Lord a lot longer than me. But all I have to do is look around. Where are the people that are sold out for the Lord? Men, women, young and old. That we know we've got a, a power in us that's different from anything the world will falsely promise. But are we living our lives like that? I don't mean this to be controversial, but I think we fear COVID more than we fear God. And I'm not being insensitive here. We've all lost loved ones, and it is real. There's other things we can talk about another time, but do we not really believe Scripture that God knows Every day of our lives, he's got a plan. He's not going to take us home any moment sooner. Are we really living, not fearlessly, 
But are we really living in the truth that we know? He is king. He is Lord. He is Savior. And maybe all of you are. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself. Maybe the Lord wanted me to, go to come to this wonderful place to just preach to myself. I don't know. And I don't think so. None of you, I suspect, even knew who I was. And I praise God for that. Not only because, praise God, you didn't know who I was, and, but that we all need to look to the king. My buddy Daryl Strawberry, who's one of my best friends, always tells me, it's never about you. There's so many people in positions of ministry that, man, they think they're a bag of chips in the whole thing, and the Lord's like, if, come on. It's what he does through you because you choose to be a servant. And I just want to thank you, each and every one of you. During worship, during that incredible worship, I prayed over each and every one of you from the back of the room, and God started talking to me about some of what you're going through. Some of you, this is the hardest season in your life. But you're here, and you're out there, and I know you're sharing the Lord. And he's with us till he takes us home. My only sadness is I, this isn't a pity party, but I get to go back to L.A. now. Man, you want to see some messed up demonic activity and people that think this is the answer, they've got it all figured out. There's so many strongholds in communities. I was sharing with Vera Shannon about a trip I took to Palm, through Palm Springs to Arizona. I was asked to preach at a church. And there are territorial spirits. I'm, I'm very schooled in the art of and the battle of spiritual warfare and demonology because coming from the New Age, when I gave my life to the Lord, I had some really strange things happen for about five years of which aren't important to share now. But I know evil exists. The world of spirit exists. And there are good and there are bad spirits. Most of the bad spirits mask themselves as good. But again, we are washed clean by the blood of Christ. I'm just going to take a moment and just quietly ask, Lord, anything else I need to share? Two things. We don't know what today holds. We don't know when we walk out of this wonderful church what the day holds. We don't know if we'll even make it through this day. But please, as a brother in Christ that does love you with the power of the Lord, if you're not right with God, get right with God today. Even quietly with Him. If you've got some things to repent of, get right with Him. Get in his word and ask him to use you. He wants to use you. That's the last thing. He wants to use you. You have your own ministries. You may not even know what that looks like. I have people all the time, Frank, I'm, I, I want to serve God. I feel like I'm called, but I don't know what it wants me to do. You have this men's ministry, thousands of men coming to the Lord. Oh my gosh, I want something like that. And I don't say it, but my thought is, trust me, you don't want something like that. With that comes a battle. Satan's not too pleased about some of the work we do at KMG. But by the blood and the power of Jesus, we tell him, shut up. And we move through and we seek the Lord's healing. Maybe it's just apologizing. Maybe it's just making a phone call. I don't know what that looks like, but God has placed you in a position of blessing and power, and you have your own ministry. Do not entertain that voice that says, that's not true. It is true. Do not entertain that voice that would keep you in the past. We have new life in Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus or you want to recommit, I mean, I 
praise God for this church. We had baptisms last week. Recommit, give your life to the Lord again. But do not entertain that lying voice because it's louder, more prominent now than ever. It's in our culture now. And it's real easy to get lost in the spirit of deception and distraction. Boy, I had a sermon lined up last night. Woo! Lord goes, not today. Just tell them who I am and love my sons and daughters. And I'm like, whatever you say, Lord. But we are watching God's truth being mocked publicly everywhere. And what do we do? That's the question. God wants to use you. We don't have to be mean-spirited. We don't have to start yelling and screaming. But just ask Holy Spirit to lead you. And he absolutely will. Until we're all home one day together, worshiping him forever. Which is the promise that is assured in our salvation. And just thank you. Thank you for listening to me, putting up with me, and loving me, and making me feel so welcomed. Trust me, I'm not into feelings, but I am a flawed, fallible, sinful man, so thank you for helping me feel welcomed, and um, keep me in your prayers as I go back to L.A., and who knows what God's got planned. I have no idea, but I'm in a season where... I'm all in. I'm really tired of living in L.A. Father, we love you. Jesus, you are Lord. Thank you for saving us from ourselves. Thank you for sacrificing on the cross. And Lord, we know you didn't die on a cross just to make us good spiritual people. You want to transform our lives. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray blessing over this church and healing over everyone in this room. And we rebuke the lies of the evil one. By the authority and the blood and the power of Jesus, you need to go back where you belong. You are not wanted in this church. You're not wanted in our families. You're not wanted in our lives. We are warriors and priests and priestesses of the most high God his name is Jesus Christ and we honor him and we glorify him Holy Spirit I just pray you just wash our flock clean everyone in this room and we walk out of here again renewed and refreshed ready for the battle at hand but with a joy and a knowing that you are you are our king. And one day we'll throw our crowns at your feet. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone in this church, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Mike. We pray protection over him and his family. And Lord, thank you for my family in this church. We love you, Lord. We honor you. And we once again recommit our lives. We surrender them to you. We will follow you, Lord. Speak to us. Teach us. Show us your truth and what you would have us do in the very short time we have left in this life. I pray this in the name above all names. I pray this in the name of our King and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us today here at the River Christian Fellowship. We hope you were inspired and enjoyed the message by Frank Sontag. Please look into his social media for more information and on the ministries that he has. 
Please join us again next week on March 28th as Ryan Rias of the Whosoever's joins us. Ryan is the co-founder of the Whosoever's Movement, a nonprofit organization that empowers students at public schools around the world to make positive choices, no matter the circumstances. He is the host of a radio talk show, The Ryan Rita Show, which is heard nationwide every Saturday night. You can hear Ryan on Effect Radio, 88.9 FM, right here in Twin Falls, Idaho, every Saturday at 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time and 10 p.m. Mountain Time. We can't wait to see you here again next week. Until then, God bless.